Good afternoon. I have the privilege of introducing the first plenary speaker in this uh, year's colloquium, Professor Ingrid Dobschies. <clears throat> Professor Dobschies was born in Belgium, started her career in Belgium, and then moved to the United States. She was a professor at Princeton for several years, and then in 2011 she moved to Duke University. She is uh, recognized worldwide for her work in applications of mathematics. Uh, she's actually one of the very few mathematicians who can boast to have uh, her mathematical work incorporated into something that we use every day because her work on image compressing is part of the uh, JPEG protocol that we all use. She works in a broad uh, scope of subjects in, in applied mathematics. Uh, a year ago she gave a lecture here on how you can tell a fake painting from a, an actual one. Um, she received several uh, awards and distinctions. I will mention just the uh, National Academy of Sciences Award in Mathematics, of which she was the first woman to, uh, to be a recipient. Uh, and uh, last but not least, she's, the, uh, she's also the first woman to uh, occupy the role of president of the International Mathematical Union. Professor Dobschies is going to speak on uh, mathemat uh, mathematics of planet Earth. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to tell you about this uh, uh, project in which I got involved, uh, to my great surprise. So, um, I, this talk will have several components. So, I will first tell you something about image analysis and compression. Which, is, uh, uh, which will uh, be based partly on my own work. And then I will, uh, in particular, I will talk about wavelets. I will then uh, give you a little crash course which contains almost everything I know about uh, uh, geophysics, about the, the, the seismic uh, tools to analyze the structure of the Earth. Uh, and we'll talk in particular about plumes and then we'll see how it came together. I mean, in particular, what happens is that uh, some geophysicists approached me with a problem in which they thought that wavelets could be used uh, uh, to good profit, and so uh, we'll see at the end where, where that's going. But uh, first, let me start with a little crash course in the mathematics of, that's underlying the JPEG 2000 standard which uh, Marcelo Viano already alluded to. Um, and what they use is a mathematical tool called wavelets in order to do image compression. Okay, so first let's, uh, this is for digital image compression. So we start with images that are digitized in which uh, the image, if we think of a black and white image, then the image consists of uh, small squares, a little pixels, that have a gray value that often is indexed from zero for all black to 255 for all white. Uh, that's an 8-bit image. You can also have 16-bit images if you go to higher resolution when you have even more different gray values. We are used to color images in which you have the same uh, structure in red, blue, and green. Uh, so again, 8 or possibly even 16 bits. Uh, for compression, these color images are typically not compressed in red, blue, and green separately. And then uh, what, happens, what happens is that typically they're transformed first into a representation that tells you how bright they are and then what color on the color wheel they occupy and then maybe how saturated that color is. So in fact for compression, the grayscale uh, 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 version is still very relevant even for color images because in a sense you do translate your image first in a grayscale version before you start uh, doing the, the compression. And that's because we are much more tolerant for inaccuracies in uh, color than we are in brightness. 
Okay, so let's I'll stick to the grayscale version here. And so uh, I'm illustrating this here with a uh, portrait of a paint, uh, with, with a picture, a digitization of a painting, uh, which I borrow from recent work I did on, on, on paintings. And so if you, I've zoomed in here on, uh, um, on, on, on this little piece, and then we enlarge and enlarge it until you start seeing the individual pixels for this particular digitization. And then these uh, pixels, this purple row here, I've given you the different uh, uh, gray values. Dark in the beginning, printed in bold for the under 100 numbers because lower numbers correspond to darker, and then it goes higher to lighter gray values. I'm, I will concentrate here on just a little bit of it, but in fact, everything I'm going to say, you have to mention not only as happening over the whole row, but over all the diff different rows of the image, and I'll come back to that. So an image, I mean, so we have here this image, and it has many pixels. Every pixel has eight bits. And so you can quickly get a, a, a megabit, a several megabits, just for one image. And if you then do a video where you, 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 you may have anything from, from 18 to 25 images per, per, uh, per second, it can become quite, uh, 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 quite uh, a quite substantial volume of memory that you would need. However, an image is highly compressible. I mean, even for very good quality. The reason for that is that in images, it's, it's very often the case that a pixel value is very, very close to its neighbors. It's not everywhere the case. And in fact, at any point in the picture is a possible place where that can fail. I mean, here from 80 to 112, I do fail. I mean, so there are many, at any place in the picture, you can fail having this, this nice continuity or this closeness of neighboring values. But in most places of the picture, you have this. And so that's what we're going to exploit, and that's what wavelets exploit, and that's why wavelets work for image analysis. What the, a, a way to, a very naive way to, uh, um, to, to encode this is to say, well, since all these pictures, since all these pixel values are close to each other, let's just compute the average for each pair. So for each two numbers, I compute one average. And even there, they are still very close to their neighbors, so I can do that again. Then these averages are not always, I mean, many of those places are places where from the average I can reconstruct or reconstruct something close to the average. I mean, but in some places that's not the case. I mean, in particular, here I have a big difference. Here also, these two are very different. So that I can uh, get by computing for every pair where I compute the average, also the difference between those two numbers. And together, of course, if I know for two numbers A and B, their average and their difference, I can recover the two numbers just by adding or subtracting. So I do even the same operations in order to get the original numbers back. But in most places, these differences are very small. Occasionally, they're not. And if I do that again at the next level, again, in most places, those differences are small. In some places, they're not. So not only have I found a way to, uh, uh, oops. So I found a way to represent my original uh, uh, set of numbers. All these 16 numbers are represented by those four, then those four differences and those eight differences that total of 16 numbers would enable me to reconstruct the original. But I also have found a way in which I have made visual that very many of those differences are small. And if I were to neglect the small differences but keep the large differences, I would reconstruct something that would be close to the original sequence. And it would have done, I mean, so in an adaptive way. I mean, I would not have to tell you beforehand where those large differences were going to happen. I just would keep the large differences where they happen, throw away the small differences where they happen, and reconstruct. And that's the essence of what happens in a wavelet transform. Of course, this was in one dimension. In images, we really have two dimensions. So back to Van Gogh, we have here a little square. 
So let me reproduce that square, the gray values, the square. And I would have to do this operation on these square values now, on these values of pixels in a square. And so I will do it on each row, and I have to compute averages. And yes, I mean, I know that the average of 121 and 122 is not 120.5. It's really 121.5. But I made that mistake when I made the slide, and when I later noticed, I, said, I, I figured I would leave it in so that uh, people would know that mathematicians are not all ones who, who make, get all their um, numerical computations exactly right if they do them in their heads. I mean, uh, so I take averages. The other averages are correct. I take averages row-wise, each pair, and that gives me now two arrays, one of horizontal averages, one of horizontal differences, and then I have to do the same thing vertically. So again, I'll take pairs vertically and take their averages and differences. So this has given me, since I had to do this for both of these arrays, this has given me a total of four different arrays. And these arrays, I mean, the first array here corresponds to averaging in both directions. All the others correspond to differencing in at least one direction. In this case, I have even differenced in both. Now, they correspond to, uh, to, to features of different nature in the original image. For instance, here, this is an array that I get from averaging horizontally and then differencing vertically. If I have something that corresponds to horizontal stripes of dark, light, dark, light, then averaging them horizontally will give me low numbers in the dark stripes, high numbers in the light stripes, low, high. And then differencing vertically will give me large numbers where I difference between low and high, or between high and low, and so on. So large numbers in this array indicate the presence of horizontal stripes. Similarly here, where I've done a, a vertical averaging and a horizontal differencing, indicates large numbers will indicate the presence of vertical stripes because now I have large, uh, uh, large, small, large, small. If I take a difference horizontally, I will get these differences of alternating large, small, and small, large. And I get the same difference in subsequent horizontal rows. And so these, since I get the same numbers in these rows, they will subsist when I take their average vertically. Finally, this corresponds to, well, differences in both directions. That's the kind of thing that something will give you large numbers there if you have the kind of structure that you would have on a chessboard, where you have a kind of, of chess pattern of large, of, of darks and lights. And that corresponds to stripes. Well, since on a chessboard you have diagonals in both directions, it corresponds really to diagonal features in both these directions. So... But then, just like I did in 1D, I will continue on the thing that was an average in both directions, and I will again compute averages horizontally and then vertically, averages and differences. And so I get numbers of the same nature, horizontal stripes, vertical stripes, and oblique stripes, as before. And so my original 16 4 by 4 uh, a set of pixels is represented by this average gray value and these different numbers. Okay, so let's do this on a real image. So um, you notice here the image doesn't even need to be square. I mean, there's no reason why it... Uh, um, so if I average horizontally and vertically for every group of two, I compute one value, both horizontally and vertically. If I space those numbers as pixels again at the same width, then I'll get an image that's half the width and half the height. And that's exactly what you get. You get a copy of the original image, but at lower resolution and rendered and half the space. Here, I'm showing to show you the numbers that correspond to averaging vertically and differencing horizontally. And as I said, large numbers here correspond to vertical features. Now, why is it so great? Well, originally I had numbers from 0 to 255. If I start making differences of those numbers, all of a sudden I can go from minus 255 to 255. 
So what I'll do in, story, in order to visualize it against an image, I'll take all these, uh, these different numbers and I'll assign to them gray values going from all black to all white. So for the two extremes. So that means that if I'm close to zero, I'm somewhere in the middle. So that middle gray now corresponds to zero. And that's why I have mostly gray. Mostly gray means most numbers here are close to zero. Do, uh, with the way of, 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 of uh, uh, projection rendering, uh, it turns out that we see black in the middle of gray much more easily than white. And so you see the black stand out most. Um, the bottom is for the differences vertically, which are, could, could horizontally be averaged or differenced. Average horizontally, difference vertically will correspond to, large numbers will correspond to horizontal features and then the other one to oblique. And you see, indeed, only the locations where I have transitions, horizontal transitions between dark and white uh, stand out here. Here I have vertical transitions that stand out. And then here you see oblique stuff. Okay, but again, I'll do this at many different scales. At this scale, I repeat. I get another copy, and I get these three species of differences again. Then this here corresponds to the first uh, lower resolution image I gave you. I need the three things that were here in order to give you the full information. And I can do this again. And again. And again. And so the numbers I visualized here on the right give you the full information for what I had in the image on the left. But we see that in all those different images, I have many, many, many zeros, and so I could forget about them. But before we start talking about compression, let's try to understand visually again what all those numbers <laughs> correspond to. So on the left here, you have the reconstruction that comes from taking into account only this low resolution thing. That's to say, remember I told you I could always go back if I had all the approximation, approximation and all the differences. Now, if I had been really doing here what I said I was doing, namely pairwise differences and averages, then what you would get for each number here would be a little block, since I did it five times, of 32 by 32 pixels that would be uniform gray. This is not what you get. You have something that's more smooth. And that's because I have been really doing a, a kind of, of generalized averaging and generalized differencing, meaning uh, that my differences correspond to differences of higher order. My approximations are still approximations that behave like the, uh, averages, but they take into account something smoother than just uh, two parents. But you still have that you can go back and forth from one representation to the other. And in fact, it's still normalized in such a way that I have a, a, a correspondence that is easily invertible. In fact, in this case, though it's not orthonormal anymore, it's very, very close to orthonormal. In fact, the exact transform used here is the transform used in JPEG 2000. So the reconstruction, the smooth representation is what you get from this uh, 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 little approximation here. And I'm now going to add in the detail layer by layer. And you see how that builds up the image slowly. And in fact, that graceful degradation as I lose detail is one of the reasons that in JPEG 2000, wavelets were adopted as a standard over the uh, uh, discrete cosine transform, which is really a Fourier transform that was used in the older JPEG standard. OK, so let's see that again. Uh, but now concentrate on two pieces of the image. So I have taken here an, an enlargement of this piece and an enlargement of that piece of the image. And we're going to, I'm going to go through these successive approximations again, but only for these little pieces of the image. So I do that here. And I hope that you will still see a slight difference. Let me go back. As I add one layer here in the sky. But from here on, actually, I don't see any changes. I'm really doing something. I'm clicking to higher and higher approximations. But if we do that for the bottom one, so we're now, again, for the two ones, we're going back to the uh, 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 lower approximation. And we'll now, for both of them, sim simultaneously click to higher approximation. And you see that even though I don't change much in the sky anymore, I do change the quality of the thing in, in, in the sail. 
And that's because I have really, where I have sharp edges, I do need all the fine scale wavelengths. And uh, there are very beautiful mathematical theorems underlying this all uh, that talk about approximation and local characterization of smoothness uh, of Hölder exponents via wavelet coefficients and so on that make all this work. So there's actually a very beautiful interplay between mathematical properties and the reality of the image compression. And so that's where we get now. We have here the resolution on the right, the representation on the right, that gives us the complete uh, 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 image as we have it on the left. Uh, if I were to take only the large coefficients, as I said I would do, which I color in red here on the right, I get the reconstruction on the left. It's not perfect. Look, I mean, if I toggle back and forth, you can see that the image on the left is not perfect. But it's pretty good, especially if you consider I've compressed by a factor of about 30. The original image was an 8-bit image. So for every pixel, I had 8 bits that gave you the exact gray value. Factor 30 means that for every group of 2 by 2 pixels, I have given you now, instead of the 32 original bits, uh, pix, uh, bits I've given you approximately 1 bit. So that would be like telling you for every group of 2 by 2 pixels, whether it was closer to white or closer to black. Nothing more. If I did that for this image, I would get a truly terrible version. Yet, with the same number of bits, I have this representation. Of course, it, I have gotten that uh, for that same number of bits because I've exploited properties of images. I've not been stupid about using my bits. Um, if you use a little bit more bits for a compression factor of only about, about uh, 10, you get a, a, a virtually perfect image. Uh, now, it turns out that for a compression factor of about uh, 10, 8 or 10, many, many methods can give you a, an image of this quality. It's the fact that for a, 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 a bit rate that's even much smaller, you can get an image that is degraded gracefully. It's not, no longer nearly perfect, but it's still very, very good. That is something that wavelets by you and that other methods couldn't. Okay, so... Something else that's very nice about this is that, as you've seen the method at work, it's very local. I can do a very fast computation. Even though some of these building blocks correspond to big things, all my computation was just local. Take parents, averages, differences, and so on. So it's very fast. And because it's very local, it's, it's, it's very, uh, the, 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 uh, the database has a very nice structure. So I can, for instance, and here I'm mimicking an application where you would try to retrieve uh, information from a distance. Uh, imagine that as you go through these, these images, uh, you recognize that in this image, this is the only field that you want. Uh, an application, for instance, is when you, from a distance, try to consult very high-resolution medical data. I mean, over a, a communication pipe that is not fast enough to retrieve at the speed you want those high-resolution images all of them. But you may be interested in seeing that over this whole image, there are certain regions that are of interest to you. And you could then mark them. Let's mark them here. Then you, were, you send that information, that marking information, to the database, and it will, up, it will know in all the detailed inf uh, images which coefficients you're interested in. And it can send you then only those. And if I reconstruct using only those red coefficients, this is what you get. And so you would get locally the high resolution without wasting it elsewhere. Okay, so I promised you that, uh, so summary of, of, of wavelets, decomposition into building blocks, I've shown you those. We have many different scales and locally we can have very fine detail where we want it. Now, that is something, these different features that you can use for computation as well. And there are groups that are exploiting wavelets for uh, computational tools, for uh, elliptic inverters, uh, elliptic solvers, for uh, other problems and so on. And what we're going to see is how to use it in this geophysics problem. So I promised you at the start something where I would explain to you about wavelets and how they use in image analysis and compression and illustrate the mathematical properties that are relevant to us, as we've seen. Different scales, 
uh, very nice localization and uh, efficient transforms. Now, next, I want to tell you about the Earth, about the structure of the Earth and plumes, and, uh, and then finally, we'll have to put it all together. So, now, after this first little crash course on wavelets, we have a crash course about the structure of the Earth and the genesis of islands. Um, and unlike the first part, the part that I'm going to present here represents virtually the totality of what I know about this topic. So please, no detailed questions about this. Well, you can ask the questions, but you will, I cannot guarantee answers. Okay, so the structure of the Earth uh, is, well, we have this, this uh, what, we, what we know and of the Earth, I mean, everything, all the minds we have and so on, are in this crust of the Earth, which is just this little very thin peel outside. Then, uh, as you go to the center of the Earth, about half the depth, but of course most of the volume, is in the mantle. And then you come to the core, which is still separated into an outer and an inner core. And although the seismic tools about which I, I, I'll be talking today, uh, which uh, will, can also tell us thing about, things about the core, for the moment uh, our computations restrict themselves to the mantle. Okay, now uh, we can, on the continents, we can, we can drill. I mean, people have drilled deeply and we can uh, look at different layers. As you all know, you can access layers of different ages by depending on where you go and how much erosion there has be, been on the earth. And so we can access very, very old rocks. So this is a billion years or in giga annum, if you want. And uh, so 10 to the ninth years. And you see we can go to rocks that are very, very old. I mean, the Earth is, is, is estimated to be twice as old as about this about. So um, this is the, 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 the age of the formation of that rock. Next. Uh, we can also access by drilling and, or, or, or diving and, and retrieving uh, samples the age on the, of the ocean floor. And here, note that this scale is million uh, mega annums, so 10 to the sixth. Ocean floors are much, much, much younger than the oldest continental rocks. And uh, you also notice that, that uh, there are these ridges where the rocks are the youngest, and then away from the ridges, they become older. Notice for later uh, reference that here, just in front of Africa, and here, about the middle of the Pacific, the North Pacific, we have fairly old rocks. Now, we have, of course, a good understanding of why we have these ridges in the ocean that are much younger, namely plate tectonics. I mean, uh, the ridges, the, 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 the continental plates are torn apart and uh, in the mid middle in the oceans, which is where the, the, the Earth is the youngest, and, and uh, we, we find uh, that new, uh, uh, new material comes up from, from, uh, uh, from the asthenosphere and uh, then moves away as it, it, it joins the plates. And <clears throat> what you find is that in the oceans, I mean, as in this model, uh, uh, where this, this, this welling up happens, the ocean, I mean, the, the ocean floor is a little higher, and in the oceans, indeed, where the ocean floor is, where you have the ridges, the ocean floor comes higher, and it's where the ocean is the deepest that the oceans are, are the oldest. And so, indeed, you have here, for instance, in front of Africa, this very deep area, and again, here, between, the, uh, between America and Asia, you have deep areas there as well. Okay, now volcanic islands. Most volcanic islands are associated with ridges. And in fact, a classical example is Iceland. Iceland is bang mid in the middle of the, the North Atlantic Ridge and has been formed by this, 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 uh, this ridge. Uh, Iceland is, 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 is very young on, on average. And Iceland is one of the few places on Earth where you actually can see the mid-Atlantic uh, uh, ridge coming through the island. It's, uh, it's a place that has been uh, considered as a very venerable and, and special place as long as people have known it. Uh, the, the, the Icelandic people held their, their annual uh, uh, big meeting, the Thing Valir, in, uh, uh, in the North Atlantic Rift. But anyway, so. But 
There are other islands that are not found, volcanic islands that are not found on those ridges, but that are on the contrary found in places where the oceans are very deep and old. So there are a couple here. I mean, there are, many, there are more than I am indicating, but uh, I remember I, I, I pointed to the fact that there's old uh, rock in uh, ocean floor in front of Africa, and the Canary Islands and the Cape Verde Islands are, 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 are uh, 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 volcanic islands, but in this old piece, uh, piece of the year. Hawaii and Tahiti are similarly volcanic, but in an old part of the uh, uh, Pacific Ocean. If you look a little closer at the Hawaiian chain, uh, which has been dated very well, then you see that uh, the oldest islands uh, uh, are the furthest from, I mean, there's a whole chain in which the age moves almost linearly as, as, as you move away from the, uh, the biggest and the youngest island. Okay, the understanding for the formation of such islands as a, a model that has been proposed is plumes. Plumes are, I mean, the idea is that there are, uh, 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 from the mantle, plumes that come up through, uh, from, the, from, from the, uh, the core of the earth, plumes that come up through the mantle and that uh, uh, kind of, of give you hotter material that comes up and that uh, forms volcanic islands. And then as the, 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 this happens all through the, the, the plates and as the plates move, the islands that have been formed move away, get eroded and become, I mean, so the older islands are the ones that are furthest away. Um, okay. Well, it's all very nice to propose models like that. What's the evidence for this? Um, how can scientists even know this? Well, for the, these, these volcanic islands, uh, what they found is that the constitution of the volcanic rock in these plume islands is very different from the ones that come up on the mid-Atlantic ridges. And so there's uh, evidence for a different mechanism there. Um, but... Uh, a lot of, of what we know about the Earth we get from seismic data. So how does that work? Well, underground such structures uh, are explored in seismology for fault zones or to prospect for oil. Uh, typically what you have is, I mean, if, for instance, if you do it in, 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 uh, under oceanic floor, is you send with a survey ship, you, with hydrophones, you send uh, uh, waves down. They reflect off the earth, and you listen. So you generate a source, you beam it into the earth, you, they reflect at these different interfaces, and you measure the reflections. And actually, the, the mathematics of that is kind of nice, because what happens is that uh, the, the, the different layers have a different uh, 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 speed for uh, different wavelengths. And so this diversity in speeds and the different depths peels away your signal into many components that, of course, then reflect at different places. And so the, it's important for the reconstruction of this that you have uh, uh, something that extends in time and that has a frequency profile. So it has these two variables. And from then, uh, you can, you can from, from, from the fact that you know uh, uh, the source and that you measure what comes back, you can then uh, hope by decomposing it in these two different uh, components, uh, these two different degrees of freedom, try to get out uh, the, the different reflecting layers and the speed of transmission through each layer. And in fact, that is how people study. Here is a, uh, a study that's done for a fault zone in, uh, uh, in California. Uh, where people use, indeed, these uh, uh, seismic tools in order to do this. But this is crust. I mean, what you really want to do, I mean, look, I mean, we're only here 1,500 meters deep. If you want to understand what's in the mantle, which is way, way deeper than this little peel of crust, then you will need to uh, look things that have much, much higher energies. There's no way you can still generate that with uh, uh, ships or, or, or explosions or, 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 or thumpers. Or, uh, what, what, you, uh, what people, uh, uh, the only wave sources that give you enough energy are really big earthquakes. And so, in fact, on Internet, openly available, 
you can find data that have been measured all over the Earth by a whole network of seismic stations for all really big earthquakes of the last 30 years or so. And so these are things that have been generated by nature, which are ways of making the Earth ring, and then you, uh, you measure the data. Okay. Now, seismology is how we study the Earth, so we want to know about these plumes. What would we do? Well, until recently, plumes were not really uh, uh, seen on seismographs. One reason for that is, and as I said, the, uh, uh, the, the evidence for the, the existence of plumes was mostly chemical. One reason for that is that the typical way of analyzing data for the full sphere is uh, in, in that, that geophysicists use is using spherical harmonics. Makes a lot of sense. If you have a sphere, you use functions that have the symmetry of, of the translational symmetry. However, that is like using Fourier uh, modes to analyze images. I mean, it's, it, it, it's exactly what was done in, in, in the, the old JPEG standard, and it also makes a lot of sense because you have translation invariance in the family of all images. If this is a valuable, Im, valid image, then this is a valid image as well among your collection of all images. But uh, it is not very good at picking out and efficiently storing and uh, efficiently computing with things that are very localized. I mean, because, well, the spherical harmonics oscillate and can do very abrupt transitions, but they typically try to then do them everywhere. When you have uh, things that you want to render that have abrupt transitions here, but probably not elsewhere, you're wasting a lot of energy. And so it's not the ideal tool for that. And so that's why these uh, geophysicists came to see me. Plumes are fairly localized, and the change in seismic wave speed is very small, so you have a very localized uh, a feature that's not very high amplitude, and uh, spherical harmonics were not so good for them. So you want to use building blocks at many different scales to capture the big features that you also have in your data, but also the very localized features, mm -hmm. And you want to be sensitive to these very localized changes. And so wavelets seem like a good idea. And that's how we're going to put two together. So what happened is that uh, two geophysicists, uh, uh, Anthony Dahlen and Huss Nolet, came to see me. Uh, they were both based at Princeton when I was still there. And they came to see me and I said, look, we have this problem. Do you think we could use wavelets for this computation? And Actually, what I'm telling you about is that adventure that we had together. So uh, I was really only the mathematical hired gun in this. So uh, could we use wavelets for their global seismographic tomography? And the reason they asked that was that uh, they had... Uh, 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 Rafaela Montelli was a graduate student of... Uh, uh, of Husnolet, who had recently done a computation that was at the very limit of what she could do with some finite element methods for these global seismic data. And she had done them several times, and she came to Husnolet and she said, I, I, I must be doing something wrong uh, because I have these weird places where I have hotter spots than I would expect. And but Hughes Nolet was very, very excited because you see, there is a hot spot just in front of Africa. And there's one here where Hawaii lies. And he realized that maybe for the first time they were seeing some evidence of the specificity of the change in the earth structure that could be due to plumes. And so he wanted to build a tool that would more unequivocally and by being able to zoom in on certain features, be able to do that. Okay. So this was then the start of a multi-year collaboration. I've listed here uh, uh, the names of all the different peoples who were on some, uh, people who were on some of the papers uh, that we did. We experimented with a number of different wavelet models. We validated and corrected our understanding, and we gradually built larger and larger models. So one intermediate model that we built, this was a model of a salt dome uh, with water in it. 
so people understand the chemistry and the physics of those fairly well, and so they can build models that are very realistic, but about which they, because they built them, they have a whole ground truth. And so uh, you see here the original salt dome, and then analysis with a whole lot of different methods. This is the standard L2 method or an L2 regularized method, which is what seism seismologists would typically have used. Uh, and you see, it's, you need the regularization because you're trying to do uh, uh, an inverse problem that's ill-posed. And what that means is that you're trying to invert a matrix that you shouldn't be inverting in the first place. I mean, it has very small eigenvalues. And so you want to use what you know about your noise process to say, smaller than this, I cannot hope to reconstruct. Let me try to be reasonable. And that's what regularization does. And you can then show that regularization makes your problem instead of, of something where you could, if you worked harder, if you work too hard on an ill post problem, you can reconstruct anything you like. You can find fairies, you can find, and so on. Uh, so you don't want to do that, but you do want to, to have a reasonable way of saying this is too far. I mean, before you see the fairies. And you, you want to, to, to find that, that trade-off in a mathematically responsible way. And that's what regularization does for your problem. It is a way of, of restoring uh, yourself to a world in which the problem is mathematically well posed, solvable, but where you're not trying to go beyond the resolution that you know you can achieve. Um, then, if you, if you uh, recently, uh, people have, have come to realize that uh, typically in an L2 regularized problem, what you say is, well, I know that my problem has on, on average some smoothness. I know certain global properties of my solution. Recently we've come to realize that very often these properties that you impose and their global properties are very well adapted to the operator you're looking at, namely in this case the wave transmission operator and reflection and so on, but may not be ideal for the object you're trying to look at. I mean, in this case, we were trying to look at something that was fairly smooth in most places, but that had sharp discontinuities or sharp spikes. Uh, things that have global smoothness typically are, they round off your sharp spikes way too much, or they round off your sudden transitions way too much. Now, if, this, if the object we were looking at had sharp transitions all over the place, then it would be hopeless. We don't have the resolution for doing that. But if we know that the sharp things are few and far between. We can hope that we can do a little better on them by using a tool that zooms in on the right places than if we try to be globally smooth everywhere. And so that is an approach that's called exploiting sparsity. So the idea is that if your object, the object that you want to reconstruct, has a sparse representation in some basis, then by working in that basis and using a regularization method that emphasizes that you're looking for a sparse object may give you a better reconstruction. So you're still using things, a priori assumptions about, you always have priori assumptions when you try to solve an ill post problem. I mean, I've had a number of people who come to me, they say, I have this ill post problem and I want you to help me solve it better mathematically. And I, the first thing I ask is, what do you know about your solution? They say, we don't want to assume anything about our solution. Because if we wanted to assume things, we would just do a fit and so on, and we don't want to assume things about our solution. And, well, in the beginning, I would try to explain about the mathematics of ill post problems and so on. What I now do is I try to just build a very brute inversion. And it gives awful results. And they say, oh, but this is impossible. I say, why? And then they say, well, why is this impossible? Because this and this and this cannot be there. So they know things. So I want, that information is what you want to exploit. I mean, so, okay. So that's what I call no fairies. So, uh, so by exploiting the fact that you know, you expect singularities in only a few places and not elsewhere, you can build a tool uh, you can work in wavelets and say, I'm going to try, uh, try to look for solutions that are sparse in wavelets. What that means is I'm not going to try to render every discontinuity, but if there are large discontinuities, I will zoom in on those. And, uh... Okay, so on the second row here, 
there are uh, what we call L1 reconstructions. So what you do here is you try to impose sparsity, but uh, you still try to keep the problem convex. Convexity is a wonderful thing because optimizing a convex problem means that you still can look for local, optimize, local optima and there will be global optima. It's a beautiful, I mean... Uh, um, what's done here is that we've used different bases. This is the basis that corresponds to simple averaging and, and, and differencing, the HAR basis, wavelet basis. This is a basis that's a little bit more complex, and this is actually a basis that are, is not quite the one that is used for JPEG 2000, but not so far off. I mean, and of these three bases, clearly this one does the best job. It gives you a more precise reconstruction of, for instance, this feature than the all smooth thing did. But it, it's not, it doesn't have the blockiness or the horizontal and vertical artifacts that this method did. Here is where we go to even more sparsity. The problem here is that you may be caught in a local minimum and not a global minimum. Now, we've tried to avoid that, but you can't guarantee it. But uh, we were glad to see, because the proof in the pudding when you do these things, I mean, we can find mathematical uh, algorithms and approaches and try to understand what the approaches do till we're blue in the face. But the proof of the pudding on a real applied problem is to work with the people who know the application through and through. In this case, we worked with a uh, geophysicist who was an expert on these salt domes, and he felt that of all these different reconstructions, this was by far the best. I mean, this one uh, is trying to build structure where there actually isn't any. I mean, and so, uh, so we were very happy with that because it showed us that in this particular problem, the convex uh, uh, problem gave actually a solution that was most acceptable to the, uh, the, 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 the expert at hand. And, uh, I mean, we, we, we prefer working with the, the convex problem anyway. So, uh. Okay, so we then, I mean, after having validated what method we needed to use, we, uh, so <laughs> we cubed the Earth. This is something I found uh, amazing. But so, actually, uh, in a lot of, of geophysics applications, people do this. What you do is you imagine a cube sitting in the center of the Earth, I mean, inside the Earth, and then from the center of the Earth, you take all the planes that are determined that go through the center and through one of the ribs of your cube. Those intersect the Earth in a, in, in a great circle. And so those cut out from the Earth's surface, uh, these square-looking uh, uh, regions limited by great circles. And each of those uh, you can uh, uh, nicely uh, break up into a kind of square grid. The beauty of that is that then within that big square, you can use methods. I mean, the Jacobian is very close to one, and you can co uh, correct for that Jacobian anyway. The change of, trans of, of, uh, of variables from a regular square grid to this uh, uh, squareoid grid. And uh, so you can work with methods that are designed for square computations. On, on, on this grid. And you do that on these six different uh, places. You at first put yourself in such places that the eight uh, 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 special points of the cube lie in areas where you have zero interest in what's going on. And so artifacts that will arise there you won't care about too much. Um, and so then we did many mathematical ingredients. We used wavelets, of course, sparse expansions. Um, now, <laughs> The algorithms. So we have now a matrix that describes the wave propagation through the many different layers. So we had a zero order model. Geophysicists have a fairly good uh, uh, idea of what the Earth looks like if you make a spherical approximate, uh, a spherically symmetric approximation. We have these different layers with different speeds of propagation. It's like a, a Mozart Kugel with different layers. And uh, they, they know those fairly well. So we have a zero-order model, and we do a perturbation to that zero-order model. And we do that with our multi-scale wave building blocks. But the whole thing, even though it was still uh, coarse in, 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 uh, in resolution, ended up with a matrix that is uh, uh, half a million by three million entries. I mean, the matrix is too big to load. I mean, 
forget MATLAB, of course, but I mean, even in a normal big computer, you have, you have to, the matrix was just too big to load. And uh, so we have this vector of uh, 3 million entries that is sparse, but we don't know where the sparsity will be. It's not that we know where the sparsity structure is. So, and you have to work with that, and you have to invert. I mean, you have to do an inverse problem. Of course, we use uh, uh, smart algorithms. But uh, in order to make those algorithms work, I mean, we now know, uh, and this is work of the last decade, that there are beautiful randomization tricks in order to get these algorithms to work faster, because typically you need a, a number of iterations of your algorithm in order to, do, to get to your solution. All that with this huge matrix. I mean... In this particular case, what happened is we, we started this project when Hus Dolet, uh, Tony Dahl, and I were all three at Princeton. But then uh, Tony Dahl was struck by a very virulent cancer, which in a year's time, I mean, he, he passed away. Uh, Hus Dolet, uh, was who had always wanted to go back to Europe, he's originally from the Netherlands, left and uh, went to Nice. And I was in Princeton. I'm not an American person holding, well, figuratively, this baby of, of three million by half a million entries. And I had nightmares about us getting this project to a good result. But uh, we, uh, so we finally, over, over many years, we, we started doing computations with the real data just a few months ago. So here is a summary of the real data for which I will show you a, a, a few results. So uh, these are real data that are registered by all those blue dots are stations and for, from earthquakes that, uh, uh, oh no, sorry, all the red dots are the stations. So we took all those stations that are available in the US and all the blue dots are earthquakes over which we had data. And so the idea was that we wanted to look at the, uh, 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 the, the cross-sections of the Earth at different parallels uh, uh, given here and given by these, these, these lines. And so this is uh, hot of the press. Well, it's, it's now three months old. Uh, the top is what you would get with a uh, regularized, with the old L2 method. Um, the reason, I mean, it shows in the deed, in deed structure, but, oops, sorry. It shows structure, but the problem was that uh, they were fairly sure that, for instance, this type of structure here was structure that was just an artifact of the method. It was showing all kinds of granularity that uh, was because they were using highly oscillatory functional functions and, and trying to reconstruct with those, and they were at the verge of what they really should be doing with those. <laughs> so uh, they wanted to have a better view of what was going on here, but they wanted that view. They knew that we could get good resolution near the, uh, near the, 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 uh, uh, the crust, but as we went deeper, the resolution was not going to be as detailed. And so with a wavelet method, you can actually put that in fairly simply, but they wanted to see then whether this stuff here was still going to survive. And indeed, we found that, uh, yes, there was fine-grained stuff happening here, and yes, here we still had surviving of this, but here, where they were very doubtful, it, it did go away. So, I mean... Short of going to sea in reality, which is way deeper than you can go. I mean, we can't go and look 500 kilometers deep. Uh, we don't have really ground truth. But it did fit with what they, for other many other reasons, expected to be there. So they have, so based on all these methods, they have now a, a, a higher confidence in what these wavelet methods can tell them. And it also gives them a good idea of how confident you can be in what the wavelets give them. So, I mean, they're very, very excited. So the adventure continues. Uh, the student, Sergei Voronin, who was one of those names I gave you, who was one of my graduate students, is now doing a postdoc in seismology in, in Nice in France. I mean, he was very excited. He says, isn't it nice to go to Nice? And, uh, I mean, uh, he made a pun about it. And uh, he has a big T-shirt that says Nice. <laughs> and, uh, but so, uh, um, but, but I'm... My role is mostly over. I mean, I was a mathematical hired gun to tell them what could be done. Could something be done? Could we adapt our methods? Could it, and so on. 
and it has, uh, and also to, 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 to be breaking. I mean, to say, whoa, 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 if, if something fantastic came out, I said, let's first see whether this is real, whether we can validate this, and so on. And uh, we are now at the stage where we have seen things that they wanted to see, and we feel we have validated that to the extent that, we, that that is possible, and something does remain. And so they're very excited about using this new tool. And that's what I wanted to tell you today. Thank you.